To know why this building is so important, we need to know some history. I'm Adam Roxby, and welcome to the Old Workhouse. This building is steeped in history, and finding out about it is really tricky. What we need is an expert. Hello, uh, my name is Ray Whitehand. I'm a leading authority on the workhouses, and in particular these parish workhouses. Perfect. Ray has written a number of books about Suffolk Parish workhouses, so I started by asking, what used to happen at a workhouse? Well, the poor would be housed here, the, the able-bodied poor, who were capable of working for a living. They would either work in the house itself or in the grounds, because you've got such a significant ground here, there would have been plenty of garden um, where produce was grown for the inmates or for selling um, to the wider community and recouping some of the cost of uh, looking after the poor. What was going on at the time that meant we had to have these buildings? These parish workhouses originated in the, um, 15, in the 16th century. The, there was a massive problem of unemployment at the time and the workhouses were initiated as one attempt at solving this problem of, like I say, mass unemployment. They specifically identified uh, what they called the deserved poor, those who were willing to work, if only they could find any. They were capable of work. And as a result of that, each parish um, was made responsible for their own poor. An overseer of the poor was created and one option he had at his disposal was to um, use parish workhouses to house this particular group of poor. The value of, of this one is because it was one of the few I know of which was specifically custom built as a parish workhouse. Workhouses served as the best solution at the time to deal with this unemployment problem, but was it a hard life? Um, it would have been a hard life for the inmates. Um, it was quite common for that to be a 12 hour day. They'd, they'd be up at say 7 o'clock in the morning, take about half an hour for breakfast, they'd then be at work, whatever the designated work for the day was, it might be spinning or something in the house if the weather was inclement or if the weather was suitable and the needs dictated it could be out either in the garden um, growing the crops for the house or in a neighbouring farm. They might be sent off to the local farmer during the day and then come home at night um, for the evening meal. So because this was such an, a, an agricultural area and that was one of the problems with the numbers of poor was because agriculture was such a, a seasonal activity there would be times when there was plenty of work for the labouring class but equally there would be times when there wasn't any work and that's why you do find a, a significant percentage of the inmates would be temporary, they would be just there out of season when there wasn't the work on the, in the community. So I asked Ray, was it hard to leave the workhouse? Um, yes, you could leave. In the majority of cases you could leave, you know, on the overseers or the, in the first issue the governor because there was a governor responsible for the workhouse, but there was an overseer who employed the governor, if you see what I mean. And um, it was, if the poor wanted to leave the house, the only thing they were in the house were, for was because they were after relief. In order to get the relief, they had to be in the house. If they, you know, they could walk out of the workhouse and look after themselves. You know, maybe they found work in the community, um, maybe they might be there through being disabled or such like. Okay, so let's break this down before we continue. The parish where the workhouses were situated had what was called an overseer, who would then have appointed a governor, this governor could have been an individual or a couple, would have then had direct control over the happenings day to day at the workhouse. With that sorted, I wanted to know what the reputation of the workhouses were like in the community. Within the local community, the workhouse was perceived differently. Really, there was two types of opinion. 
there was the ones who actually created them and um, looked after the workhouses, ran the workhouses, who were, were caring people. They wanted the poor to, you know, they wanted to look after the poor, um, provide for them sort of thing. But there was some, there were some very hard taskmasters who cracked a whip and were severe in their attitude towards the poor. The, the poor feared it, partly because of the perception um, created by a part of the community. It was seen as the last place on earth to go in the majority of cases. Although, like I say, because it was as a, as a temporary um, re resort for the inmates, they were, they didn't despise it because they needed it at the time. But they would soon, like I say, as soon as they, if they were there because of uh, a broken limb or something, you know, and unable to work and that, they would quickly want to get out again, sort of thing. Okay, so I know what you're thinking. When you think of workhouses, you think of large buildings with grubby children begging for more gruel. Please, sir, I want some more. The union houses, like the ones Dickens created, sort of thing, um, they came along after the parish workhouse stopped being used, well, stopped its existence, if you like, sort of thing. Um, the, the principle uh, seemed to be um, a good one in general, but it was the cost of running these workhouses by the individual parish, because that was the crux of the matter then. Each parish was responsible for its own poor, and so each parish had to fund it. So over time, these modest sized buildings, for example, the workhouse we have here was for about 200 inmates, gave way to the larger and more cost-effective union houses. I found that information out on Wikipedia, but finding out about parish workhouses is a lot more difficult. Research in these parish workhouses is notoriously difficult. I initially found reference to one, and so I looked for or for information on it and I couldn't find anything anywhere and I spoke to a doctor of history about it, uh, Dr David Diamond, and he said to me there's nothing been written on it, it's your life's work and basically that's what, how I came to be involved and there's some basic um, sources to go for initially like the overseer's accounts um, Occasion, very occasionally you'll get workhouse, specific workhouse records um, and these are in the parish records which were originally church records. Um, but after that it's really a case of digging deep. They might be in charity records, they might be in manorial or estate papers, you just get little references to them. Um, yeah, that is that is very hard. I've been, I've been doing this 20 years now. When you talk about the parish workhouses, there's not many people delve in them because of this fact. The information is so hard to find. Thankfully, Ray has the skill and the determination to find out all of this information, and during his research, he uncovered the original builder's estimate for the old workhouse. What I've got is the builder's estimate for 1783. An estimate of building a workhouse at Assington, 52 foot long, 18 foot wide and 15 foot high, to be daubed and thatched with garrets over the whole house, according to a plan delivered. But sadly I don't have a copy of the, of the plan, but you can get a fair idea of um, the structure from the information. But the other document of interest as in 1808, there's an inventory of the building. Um, no doubt this was when the governor was changing, they were changing governor sort of thing. One had either retired or died and, and they were getting a replacement. That was a common thing for the, um, for there to be an inventory, a stock take, taken if you like. So when the new governor came in, you knew exactly what he got. And he was then responsible for making sure everything was replaced. I'm going to interrupt Ray one last time to give you as much information as we currently have about this workhouse. As Ray said, the estimate for the building was given in 1783, with construction being completed soon after. 
The building continued to serve the parish in its capacity as a workhouse up until 1834 after which it was divided into four cottages, which explains why we have four doorways. Now this conversion will present some issues in the restoration process but we'll get to that later in the series. After the Four Cottages stage of its history, the workhouse was then unified and inhabited from 1932 to 1997 by a prolific and by all accounts talented piano teacher. The building was then owned by another family but a number of factors led to the workhouse being neglected right up until December of 2015, where we had a nail biting auction Unbelievable. And we officially took ownership in January 2016 and we've been trying to bring it back to life ever since. Anyway, back to Ray for more history of parish workhouses. And I don't want people to get too lost in all this information, so I asked Ray how the system of government worked at the time that these workhouses were in operation. Yeah, well, the parish was responsible for itself. Each parish was independently managed by itself. And the, the key group was what was called the Parish Vestry. This was a group of local, and they could be um, farmers, they could be estate holders, they could be just ordinary um, residents in, in the parish. But they would get together periodically in what became known as the Parish Vestry building because you get these two definitions for a, of a parish vestry. One is the body of people who run it and one is the property in which the, 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 the group met. Now sometimes the vestry was a room in the church but that they would be, depending on the size of the property, they could be anything between six and a dozen individuals making up the parish vestry and within that there was a number of officers um, each parish created and you got the overseer you got a constable vaguely along the lines as the police constable but a slightly different role you know a much earlier role this was long before the police constable was created you would get a surveyor who was sort of in charge of like roads and such like um, and there was about five maybe six officers which I can't think out of the top of my head but that was basically what happened you had this little breakdown within the vestry of responsibility for the different sort of aspects of the parish. Okay so for further clarification Ashley Cooper in his book Heart of Our History quotes the Encyclopedia Britannica for his definition of a parish in which he states that a parish is the area assigned to a single priest and to whom its tithes are paid. Ties being usually one tenth of a person's earnings or produce which was taken as an early form of taxation. So how did these parishes come about building or acquiring the workhouses? That might be they used a property they already exist, they already owned, a parish workhouse, a pa sorry a, a parish house and just converted it so as it, it could be used for employment within the building. I mean the obvious thing is open up some of the rooms sort of thing. Um, so, um, poor house was one. Um, other parishes had guild halls, which they made use of. They were ideal for them, um, and they might just be something that a, a, a parishioner would bequest to them in their will um, at some stage. But because of this, and because of the type of buildings they were, they were often buildings that weren't used for any, weren't needed for anything else. So the parish would adopt them and adopt them and adapt them as a parish workhouse. One building fell into disrepair, and so they found another one, and that fell into disrepair, and so they found another one. And I mean, the, the natural assumption here is that the officers at Assington were. Yeah, like the idea of the workhouse, but because they'd had two previous ones, which, like I say, had outlived their, no, they hadn't outlived their purpose, the other way around sort of thing. The building had collapsed, and so they'd had to look for somewhere else, and for that reason, they decided, yeah, this was a venture well worth putting money into, and so they built the 
what we're settling in now. So my last question to Ray was how the workhouse as an institution came to an end. Well, like I say, you, you, you know, when this stopped being used as the workhouse, uh, the 1834 Act um, effectively ended the parish workhouses, but they created the union houses, as I would say, these big incorporation buildings, union buildings, which could accommodate anything up to 600 inmates, and they covered anything between 15 and 36 different parishes in different parts of the county. Um, and they, some of them fell into disuse very quickly or disrepair and the inmates were moved around from one union house to another. But the final demise of the union houses really came in the 20th century after you got things like the national insurance um, the old age pension. Many of the uni many of the workhouses had stopped really functioning for their original purpose by then anyway. The final demise happened 18, sorry, in 1930. You got uh, the National Health Act in on the 1st of April 1929, which effectively finished the whole poor law system and created the National Health Authority, I think it was called, and that actually ended the parish workhouse then. Oh, sorry, the workhouses then. The existing buildings were, well, in many cases they were still very sound, and they then became, initially they became geriatric hospitals, and some of them which still live um, list, uh, still survive today have now become homes for in some cases social housing and in some cases very affluent there's um, one at Nacton which has just been redeveloped into 12 apartments and you can buy one of the apartments for 1.4 million pound so that's, that is how things turn around, yeah, and yet things are still the same. You've still got this problem of what to do with those who fall in hard times through no fault of their own. Thanks for watching this episode of The Old Workhouse and also thank you greatly to Ray Whitehand for giving us his expert opinion. Please do consider supporting us on Patreon if you want us to get more experts and go to different locations as well to get a greater sense of their local history and where this building fits in. Or if you just want to subscribe to us on YouTube, then that's fine. We're also on Twitter where you can follow us at The Old Workhouse or visit our website, theoldworkhouse.tv. Finally, if you want to ask me questions, you can just email governor at theoldworkhouse.tv. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see you all again next time.